One of my favorite passages comes from the book of Psalm, verse 37, verse 25, chapter 37, verse 25. It says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Now listen to that revelation. I was young and now I'm old, and I have never seen what? The righteous forsaken. You know, that, that word forsaken is a very interesting word in the Hebrew. It's a profound word because it has many, it has multiple meanings, meanings but it's the word azab. A-Z-A-B in the Hebrew. The reason that's important tonight and the reason I want to make sure that you understand is because that word forsaken, I think many of us at times, there are moments in our life where we have felt forsaken. We know what it means to be forsaken. We know what it means to be rejected. But I want you to hear this. That word forsaken, azab, means this. To leave, to forsake, to depart from, leave behind, let alone, to abandon. I don't know about you, but if you've lived on earth long enough, you've had moments, even as a, as a pastor's kid, I've had moments where I felt abandoned. You know, it was, it was back in the day, we we're in Connie Street, if you've been to Maui, there's our old, old church on Kane Street. It's a little old. It's a little rustic, if you want to say. A lot of homeless people would hang out there. It was a little scary. And it was back in the day where there were no cell phones. I Believe it or not, there was a day where that uh, actually happened. For all you millennialists, there's a day without cell phones. And I remember there was a payphone at our church, and I was at a practice. I was at a youth practice, and my mom was supposed to pick me up at a certain time. And so everybody went home, and I said, oh, don't worry about it. My, my mom's going to pick me up. My mom's going to pick me up. Well, I'm at the church, and it's 5 o'clock, so it's not that late yet, and it's not that dark, and everything's okay, and it goes from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock to 6.30, and it, it starts getting late. And I start getting scared because I'm just a young boy. I'm probably... 12 years old. Gets to 7 o'clock and by this time it's, it's getting dark and I'm afraid. And I have no money to put into the pay phone. I don't even know what's going on. I try calling my parents collect. Do you guys remember those days? <laughs> Bob had a baby. It's a boy. And uh, couldn't even reach my parents. I didn't know where they were. Well, funny thing was this. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm so angry at my mom, angry at my, my sisters. How, how dare they abandon me? How dare they forget me? And you know, the interesting thing was, is they were under the impression that I had communicated to them that I was going to ride home with somebody else. And the whole time it was just a misunderstanding. They're not bad parents. They're not negligent parents. They love me. As a matter of fact, my mom, I mean, she was crying for hours when she found out what happened. It was just, it was a misunderstanding. She, they thought that I was going to my friend's house, which I was supposed to, but there's a lack of communication. You know, we've all come to points in our life where we have felt abandoned. But you know what's so incredible about God? Is that we get a revelation that God will never leave us nor forsake us. That we will never be forsaken by God. When we, when we were on our trip, I, I kind of got this revelation on our trip because we went to different places. We went uh, in, in Las Vegas. We were going around the Las Vegas Strip. Our first night in Las Vegas, staying on the Las Vegas Strip. It's pretty crazy. We actually stayed at the Marriott, which is like a family resort. There's no gambling in it. So it was actually really good for my kids. But we, we braved the storm and decided to go on the strip. First night, a guy, you guys remember, I think it was like Batman the, 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 with Joker. You know the Joker on Batman? The, 
uh, Heath Ledger played the Joker and what Heath Ledger looked like, super freaky. That first night we get out on the strip, the moment we step out on the strip, this guy dressed like the Joker, Heath Ledger Joker is right behind us. And I've got my kids, and we're all telling our kids. And it was the craziest thing because we couldn't tell our, you know, every time some, somebody from one of the shows would come out, we're like, oh my goodness, turn left, turn left. No, we're, we're like blocking our kids like this. We're... I've never walked with my kids so close before in my life. We realized that night, we realized, wow, we're definitely not going on the strip at night. <laughs> it's very different. We went to a water park in Las Vegas, and of course, I'm just I'm keeping my eyes on my kids. Just where, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Don't I want them? Because the floor is super slippery, and you want to make sure another kid slip and fall and hit their head. And we go to we go to the zoo, and you know, with all the stuff that has happened, kid getting the four year old boy or that four year old kid falling into that gorilla. Oh, Lord, help me. So we're walking around the San Diego Zoo, and I'm just kind of, yeah. where's my kids? What's going on? We get to the rhino area. I'm like, where's Hasten? Where's Hasten? <laughs> my eyes were locked on them. We go to Legoland. I'm just, where, where are my kids? I want to make sure. I'm, I'm always making sure I know where my kids are. And I get this revelation because I'm compelled by love toward my children. I care for them. It's, now, listen to this. This is something that we have to understand. As a father, there's a part of something my, called my instinct. Because of my relationship with my children, because of who my kids are, there's a natural instinct inside of me to protect, to guard. If it, and, and, I mean, I wanted to turn around. Seriously, I wanted to turn around and sock that joker right in the face. I was like, dude, back up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Back up, dude. Protective. Why? It's a part of my nature. The instinct, my natural instinct as a father. And I realize, I get this revelation as we're going through all these different things, going to all these different places, that that's how God is with me. Number one, it's a part of his nature. As a father, he's protective over me. Why? I'm his kid. You're his child. God's protective over you. Now, some of you may think that God doesn't care about you. Some of, may, some of you may think, well, hey, you know, I'm saved, but God just kind of left me. No, no, somebody here needs to hear this tonight. God cares about you. It is a part of his nature of who he is to protect you. It is a part of who he is that when the devil comes up against you, he raises a standard against the devil. It is a part of the nature of God to fight for you. God is not slack. He's not slack on trying to protect you, on intervening in your life. He doesn't back up and say, well, you know what? My son just needs to learn how it is. Too bad for him. He's got to grow up. He's four years old. Can you imagine if someone came to beat up on my son and I just said, oh, wow, he needs to grow up. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> what by like lickings? As a dad, I would step in, wouldn't I? Why? It's a part of who I am. It's the instinct that I have as a dad. Now, you ready for this? It's who I am based upon who he is. Amen. Did you hear what I said? Because he's my son, because they're my daughter, I respond a certain way. David says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. How is it? Why? It's because of the relationship that we have to God. We are his children. So he responds to us. He responds to our enemy. He responds to the battles that we face. Not as orphans, but as his children. Amen. Responds to you because of who he is and who you are. He sees what you're going through. 
and he's not a neglectful God. He doesn't, he, he, can you imagine as a human dad, I just let my kid just run astray and not be blessed, be vulnerable to the attacks of people. Can you imagine? I would be seen as a horrible, neglectful father. But isn't it interesting how the Bible paints a picture? Jesus paints a picture of the Father. It says this. As you fathers, if your son asked you for bread, would you give him a stone? How much more would your Father in heaven... You being evil would give good gifts to your children. How much more your father give good gifts to those who love him? <laughs> what does that mean? Take who I am and the relationship that I have with my children, the relationship I have with my wife, and multiply that by a thousand. And that is how God treats you. That is what God thinks of you. That's how God protects you. That's how God surrounds you. You are his kid. You're his kid. But you know what's also amazing to me is that it's his love toward us. He is a God full of love. He's so, you know, it's so crazy to me. I still try and figure out how in the world my wife is so enamored with me. I mean, it's crazy. I, 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 sometimes I look at her and I say, how, is, how does this work? I look at my wife, I'm like, how in the world did God give me such an incredible wife? I mean, she's like awesome. She's amazing. She's like the perfect helpmate for me. She's amazing. I couldn't have asked for a better wife. Awesome. And so there's moments where I'm like, God, how does this work? I look at my wife, I'm like, are you sure you love me? Like, how is this working here? You know why? Because this is the problem. Sometimes I look at me in the mirror and I look at my wife. And so I try and compare my wife's love based upon the perception of myself. I'm going to try it on this side. I try to understand my wife's love for me based upon the perspective that I have of myself. And so because I have problems of the way I view myself and my insecurities, guess what happens? I now have questions about the love of my wife. And a lot of us treat God the same way. We look at who we are, our insecurities, our downfalls, our problems, our issues, our frailties. And because of that now, what we do is we look at the love of God with a different perspective. Why? We're trying to view God's love based upon the view we that we have of ourselves, versus not being able to understand how it is that a loving, awesome, wonderful God could love something so unlovely. And it has nothing to do with who you are. It has everything to do with who he is. I'll say that again. It has nothing to do with who you are. but everything to do with who he is. That's why he can love you the way he loves you. Even though you can't even imagine, even though you can't fathom it in your mind, that's how God can love you the way he loves you is because his love is determined upon who he is, not upon who you are or your frailties or your issues or your problems or your downfalls or your mistakes or your sins or your failures. And so what we try and do is we, we continue to try and view this relationship that we have with God and we have this dysfunction in our relationship because we don't understand that his love is based upon the perfection and the grace and the mercy and the goodness of who he is not who I am and so he loves me with a perfect love why because he is perfect not because it's my perfection his love his perfect love has nothing to do with my perfect life come on some of you can get this it'll free you up his perfect love has nothing to do with the perfection of my life that the more perfect I am, the more perfect His love is. No, His perfect love is made perfect within Himself of who He is from the very beginning of time. 
He had a love for me that was perfect, unadulterated love, unending love. You know, the problem is I can't receive it. See, there's a debate going on. A lot of people say, well, is God's love unconditional? The Bible says that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy has never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That is a promise that we can hold on to that God's love is completely and totally unconditional. But how is it that an unconditional love can have a condition? Because God's love, as unconditional as God's love is, God's love is also conditional. Why? It is based upon the condition of your ability to receive it, understand it, take hold of the love that He has for you. As a matter of fact, I'll say it this way. God's love, is, the condition of God's love is based upon the condition of your heart. You see, my, love, my wife could love me with an, unkin- an unconditional love, but if I continue to view her love toward me and the way I view myself, I can never be a recipient of that unconditional love because I have a condition upon myself of who I am. Oh my goodness, if some of you get this tonight, it'll change your life forever. Husband will cuss you out, say things to you, and all of a sudden in your mind... It switches because you believe the curse. You believe what was spoken over you. Some of you had parents that talked down to you. Some of you experienced horrible things in your life in relationships. And so the worst part about it is you view God's love through the filter of your disappointment and your hurt. You know what makes that so bad? Is that filter becomes the catchment system on your ability to receive God's love towards you. See, a lot of us don't understand that sin, people say, well, you know, who can separate us from the love of God? Nor height, nor depth, nor width can separate us from the love of God. You're right. But friends, this is the problem. It is not God's love It's not God's love that gets contaminated. It is our life that gets contaminated and hinders us from receiving God's unconditional love. Some of us don't understand that sin in our life contaminates our ability, hinders our ability to receive God's perfect love. So the worst part about this is that in our hearts, We now make a decision, we make a determination that God is a forsaken God. And we look around, where's God? Where's God? Where's God? God, see, God, you left me. And you know how we think that way? We actually believe the lie of the devil. Because what the devil does is he preys upon our insecurities because our identity is not steadfast in him. Because our identity is not secure in Christ and who we are in Christ. It gives way for the enemy to lie to us and prey upon our insecurities. Where's God? See, God left you. God forsook you. See, if you you were better looking, if you were better at this or better at that, if you could just do this and do that, see, if you didn't battle with this when you were a kid, it would be different. Hmm. I never leave you or forsake you. It's a promise. I want everybody to turn back to Deuteronomy, and I just want to close here. Are you guys getting anything out of this tonight? (laughs) Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. Isn't it interesting? <clears throat> we base everything and how we respond to the situations of life based upon now the perspective that we have of ourselves, which now takes us to a point of receiving what God has for us and who he is to us. So it starts this chain reaction. I want you to hear this again. It starts a chain reaction Because we find ourselves in a situation 
and we say, hey, God's not for me. God's not with me. And we lose heart. We give in to fear. But can you imagine if you got your perspective right? That God loves you. That God is for you. That he'll never leave you nor forsake you. When you come to moments, guess what happens? That proper perspective will produce in you courage. That proper perspective will produce within you boldness. That proper perspective will begin to transform the way you live. Because you will look at impossible situations and realize God is for me. God will never leave me nor forsake me. Can you imagine even in those moments where Paul was facing horrendous situation, tribulation, he could make an audacious statement that if God be for me, who can be against me? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This man had such boldness. Why? He had a proper perspective of who he was in the eyes of God, which gave him the boldness to say, hey, I'm going to stand firm. God hasn't left me. Man, I've made some dumb decisions. Anybody in here remember make dumb decisions? Praise God, I'm so glad I'm not the only one. I have made some dumb decisions in life. And isn't it funny when you make a dumb decision, you automatically go, well, I deserve persecution. I deserve what's coming to me. I, 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 I deserve the pain. I, I deserve all this stuff. Come on. Don't we, don't we do that? We deserve it because we made a dumb decision. Oh, the worst part about that is this. We actually tie God's hands behind him. We tie his hands from moving in our life. Why? Because instead of being partakers of his grace and mercy, grace being what? Unmerited favor. Receiving something that we did not deserve. Mercy being not receiving something that you do deserve. So you do something dumb. Now I'm not saying do dumb things all the time and on purpose. I feel like I'm going to do something dumb today. Don't do that. Right? But when you fall into that place in your life where maybe you've made a mistake, done something dumb, how do we pick ourselves up from that and realize that God is for us? That his grace and mercy is made active in our life. You see, can I just tell you something? Grace and mercy is nothing without opportunity. Does that make sense? Let me explain what I'm saying. If you don't need grace, then what is grace? If you don't need mercy, then what is mercy? Grace and mercy function off of opportunity. God exercising his grace. If God's going to exercise his grace, what does that mean? You need grace. It means you need favor that you don't have. When you need mercy, God exercises his mercy in your life. What does that mean? You probably did something dumb. And you get something coming to you. A judgment coming to you. But God in his wonderful power exercises his mercy and says, hey, I'm going to step in and I'm going to help. Opportunity. That's why the word says that in my weakness, he's made strong. It's opportunity for God to intervene. We need to change our perspective. Friends, we have to change our perspective. And he is a God that will never leave us, nor forsake us. You are never forsaken. <laughs> I'll say it again. You are never, ever, ever forsaken. With every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know what you're going through right now. 
Some of you need God's grace and mercy bestowed upon your life. Some of you, you are in a place of perfect opportunity. (laughs) God, I need you to intervene. God, I need you to move. Friends, can I just tell you something? God does not miss an opportunity to display his power. God does not miss an opportunity to manifest his love in your life. See, when I was at those those places in the midst of those crowds with my family, I held my family tight. I never let my kids out of my sight because of who I am, because of the love I have for them. In the same way, friends, God is toward us. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what you're going through, He's not going to let you out of His sight because of who He is and the love that He has for you. Because of who He is and the love that He has for you.